So this is turning out to be some decade, a decade of pandemics. No one in our wildest of imaginations would have thought what we are facing now in the first two years of this decade. First, we had the SARS-CoV-2, the COVID uh, pandemic, and now we are facing this monkeypox virus. Now we very well know that the pandemic potential of an RNA virus is higher because the process of copying doesn't include any proofreading, resulting in higher mutation rates than the DNA virus, which increases its infectivity and disease severity, uh, causing ability. But not to be left out in this uh, pandemic in this decade, uh, this is the first time that the DNA virus is uh, causing a pandemic. Now, WHO labeled this monkeypox as a public health emergency of international concern. So this system of uh, uh, PHEIC has been in vogue since 2005. Seven times it has been uh, um, given since 2005. So we see it has been given for swine flu, polio, Ebola, Zika, again Ebola, and obviously COVID. First time this public health emergency of international concern has been given that to a DNA virus. So the basic differences in DNA and RNA virus, why we should be looking at this aspect, the two most important points are that the DNA viruses have a lower mutation rate. So obviously we are not looking at uh, uh, various types as we are seeing in COVID, various strains that are coming up one after another. We do not expect this in monkeypox virus being a DNA virus. Also, if this disease does go on to become endemic in different parts of the world, a virus if required for monkeypox, specific virus, any vaccine that is required, the vaccine efficacy is much more higher in cases of the DNA virus compared to that of RNA viruses. The first question is why monkeypox? So, so many viruses are out there, in particular orthopox viruses. Why monkeypox has come into picture? Now, the orthopox viruses is a big group and they have a different host range phenotypes. This specialization, which host they will infect, is achieved by various due to various genetic laws that happens, what is known as reductive evolution. So we see camel pox virus, variola virus, these infect only camels and humans. There are some cryptic orthopox viruses about which the host reservoirs are not very well known. These include Alaska raccoon pox virus, but they are again very limited number of hosts that they can infect. But when we look at uh, monkeypox virus and cowpox virus, they can infect a very large number of hosts, including human beings. So the chance of a zoonotic leap from any of these animals to humans is much higher in case of monkeypox virus when we compare it to some other viruses like raccoonpox or a camelpox virus. So we are now facing a monkeypox virus. So this has been there for many years. In fact, more than five decades. The first case was reported in 1970. Uh, that was in Congo. First, it was identified. It may have been present earlier. First, it was in 1958 identified in a monkey. That's why the name monkeypox comes. Subsequently, human beings, the first case was reported in 1970. Then on and, on and off, we had some outbreaks, 71, 75, 80. A thing to note in particular, from 1970 to about 2000, in this period, the number of cases that happened was always in single digits. One, one, two, six, one, three, four. So the virus was doing the zoonotic leap. It was coming to human beings from the animal, but somehow it was not able to get transmitted among human beings. So it was being curtailed. Now something has changed over the last two decades, if you look. USA 2003, 47 cases of uh, monkeypox human infections were documented and this was carried through a pet uh, uh, dog. Subsequently in Congo 11 cases. So we see Sudan 19 cases. The number of cases have been gradually increasing over the last couple of decades. Now this partly may be due to 
better surveillance in the modern times, recent times. Uh, but we also need to ask the question whether the virus is changing. Why is it causing more cases in the recent years? Uh, the current clade of the virus which is in circulation is the West African clade. Uh, in fact, only a couple of days back, WHO uh, gave it a new name. Uh, it is better not to call uh, it by a name of places. So they have renamed or redesignated the Central African, uh, mm, the variant, the Congo Basin variant as clade 1 and the West African variant as clade 2A and 2B. The further details are evident, but it is clear that the current uh, outbreak that is happening is due to clade 2. This basically originated in Nigeria. So Nigeria documented its first case in 1971, two cases. After a gap of seven years, another case was identified. There were no cases for a long time till 2017. 2017-18, over one year, they documented 132 cases with a mortality rate of around 5%. And subsequently, this has not waned off. It has continued. It has continued over the last four or five years and has also been exported to various countries like UK, Israel, Singapore, US, and all of these are imported cases among travelers. So roughly around 500 cases have been documented for the last four or five years of this particular clade that is in circulation. And now it is causing a major outbreak across various continents. And most of the times it is uh, independent of any travel history. So what has changed? For sure, uh, virologists have been uh, monitoring this virus. The mutation rates that were, had been seen earlier in this virus were much less, but off late, much more mutations are being identified in this virus. So the virus has uh, been taking the zoonotic leave many a time since last 50 years, but somehow it has not gone on to cause epidemics of, or a pandemic uh, till recently. That was because the transmission from one person to another has been very limited till now. So for the virus to cause a, a large scale epidemic or pandemic, some new mutation has to be there, which revs up their reproduction number. That is the expected number of infection caused by one person to propagate the epidemic. Now, this is very early days. Only one study has looked into this. What it has observed is that accelerated evolution of this monkeypox virus is driven by this ApoBEC3 action. Now, this ApoBEC3 is basically apolipoprotein B editing complex. It is a part of our innate immune system, which particularly acts against the DNA viruses and the retroviruses and inactivates it, causing mutation in them, not allowing them to cause disease. Though infection may happen, but it doesn't allow to cause disease. So somehow, probably this group suggests that some mutations have happened, that the current monkeypox virus strain that is in circulation is evading our innate immune system. So that is one of the hypotheses. We still will be hearing a lot more about the potential causes. Okay, so let's come to the current outbreak. It was first uh, came to light on 6th of May. Uh, when two British residents traveled to Lagos and Delta region, Nigeria came back to UK. They were confirmed to be a monkeypox uh, um, virus disease. Then 17th May, uh, another, another four cases were identified in England. And very soon the cases were identified in various parts of Europe and US. The first case was detected on 18th of May. So within a month, we see it has spread across different continents. In India, the first case was identified in Kerala. It was among a, uh, in a traveler. It was picked up on 14th of July. Now, the genomic analysis has shown that this is a West African clade. What we now will henceforth will be seeing as clade 2. And it is a B1 variant of it that is predominating in Europe and US. Uh, a very close, uh, uh, closely related variant, A2 variant, has been detected in the sample, the first uh, sample that, uh, that has been done in NIV Pune. And subsequently, after 14 July, we have this WHO declared this uh, monkeypox outbreak as a public health emergency. So let's see how it is progressing. You see, this is the epidemic curve, May initial part, very few cases. Then we see it has suddenly taken off and has reached to around 35,000 cases. So this does mean that the uh, 
uh, RO number, R0 number, reproduction number is more than one. The estimate that has come, the effective reproduction number as of now is 1.29 with a credible interval of 1.26 to 1.33. Simply it means it is spreading and it is spreading fast in certain parts of the world. Which parts? So these are the top six countries, uh, countries with the highest number of cases. We see United States, roughly around 11,000 cases. It, it is more than one third of the diagnosed cases as of now. It may well be due to partly due to a very good surveillance system there, but obviously the number of cases are very high there. And the other countries that closely follow are mostly European countries, Spain, Germany, England, and also Brazil in there. So these are the six topmost countries having the highest number of cases at this point in time. And as of today, uh, we have around roughly 32,000 cases across 89 countries. And as of date, reported mortality is 12, coming out to with a mortality rate of 0.04%. India, till yesterday, has reported 10 cases with one mortality. So this is the status of epidemic, the numbers of which group of people are getting affected. So this data is from WHO, uh, situation report three that came on 10th of August. So majority, nearly all of them are males, 99% males, young males, median age is 36 years. Males between 18 to 44 constitute 77% of cases and only less than 1% are among children and among cases with known HIV status. 39% are HIV positive. By mode of transmission, they look for, so this is a cause of concern. Sexual encounter has been documented in 90% of cases as the mode of transmission. There are other person-to-person -person contact with fomites, etc., and one healthcare associated case, but vast majority, 90% are through sexual encounter. So now this brings us a question to the question, is it an STD? Now let us look more closely into this data which came in NEJM paper, which uh, gathered more details about this transmission. The results are pretty much similar to the WHO data. Median age is again young. It is males and 98% MSM, more than 99% males, concomitant STD in nearly 30% of cases, and travel history is present in only 27% of cases. However, transmit, uh, in this cohort of uh, 500 plus patients, 20% didn't re report any sexual contact in the last three months. So we need to understand that uh, this time the virus is behaving differently, causing different type of lesions. These are mostly genital rash. So this is spreading via direct contact, skin to skin contact uh, that is occurring in MSM. But uh, it, it is not prudent in my opinion to label it as STD because it ultimately is uh, spreading through no skin to skin contact. So looking at the transmission chain, we have the primary host at the rodents. A large number of rodents has been reported in uh, Africa. The wild animals will be uh, reservoir for this infection who are the primary host. Monkeys and non-human primates are accidental hosts, as is the human being. Usually, which uh, in the zoonotic leaf happens during uh, in Africa during various processes like bushmeat hunting. As of now, till very recently, the chain used to stop here. The transmission from one human to another was not very common till very recently. However, it has changed now. We very well know that it is getting transmission. The most uh, common methods is by close contact. Also, large respiratory droplets may transmit it. A broken skin will help in easier transmission. Congenital transmission is also uh, uh, possible. Zoonotic obviously may happen. Sexual contact again, um, as we discussed, the MSM. So it is again a possibility. Very important is domestic animals. Can this virus be transmitted to domestic animals? But the most important question that we need to understand now, uh, as this spreads across nearly 90 countries now, till now the virus had been localized to some African countries, endemic for more than five decades, causing one, two, five cases every now and then. But now, since it has caused a large epidemic 
across the continents in various continents across 90 countries will it become endemic in all these countries so the most important thing you have to understand is with will this virus be transmitted to the reservoirs of that local place till now many countries had imported cases like singapore us uk prior to this outbreak but it never become endemic in that country possibly because the virus didn't establish itself in the local uh, reservoir host but this time we need to see since the cases are very large can this spill over from human beings to the animals pets or wild animals and then get sustained in the local environment and lead to an endemic state of monkeypox because that will have uh, uh, much implication in terms of whether we need to have vaccines in long term for some particular high risk uh, groups etc the period of transmission as we very well know uh, is from the appearance of symptoms to until rashes fully healed and fresh layer of skin has formed now there is there is some data which suggests that it may be transmitted even before symptoms appear through respiratory droplets but this will be very very minor but even if that is true so now this evidence comes only uh, four or five days back uh, this evidence has come from france where human to dog transmission pet dog has been documented till now in africa what has been documented was in wild animals but now in domestic pets it has been documented in fact the dog had developed very similar lesions to monkeypox uh, viral infection as with humans so this is a red sign if this does get spilled over into the uh, animal reservoir then it may become in different parts of the world so the virus enters so let's see what's the pathogenesis the virus enters through the mostly through direct skin contact uh, abraded skin will be helpful in the transmission it may also come through respiratory droplets it then establishes itself in the local tissue and the lymph nodes what is called the primary uh, viremia is the incubation period from here on it goes into uh, uh, the lymphoreticular system the phase of secondary viremia when we have the fever lymphadenopathy and other uh, symptoms appear and finally from here it goes into the tertiary organs and overwhelmingly more than 99 percent cases it is only the skin presenting as a rash later on in the disease course so this is important to understand uh, which samples need to be taken at different phases of the illness so obviously incubation period no testing febrile period when we do not have any rash a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab uh, may be taken and subjected to a pcr rash uh, once developed is the best sample to be taken the lesion to it roof or the base or the crust can be sent and again submitted to pcr our antibody test is also being done. In fact, uh, NIV Pune has advised, uh, besides the rash sample, also to send blood sample, urine sample, and that is prudent to have a complete data you know, when we are having an outbreak of a new virus. So let's look at how do these patients present. So there are basically two phases: prodromal period, which lasts up to five days, where we have fever, lymphadenopathy, headache, myalgia, back pain, severe fatigue. Basically, we cannot differentiate it from many other infections that happen, and particularly uh, during this time period in India. And rash, which occurs one to three days of fever onset and may last up to two to four weeks. Now, clinical features have varied from time to time. If we look across various case series, uh, it is prudent to compare this uh, for the current clinical features with what has been reported with the same clade causing infection in Nigeria. It is, it has, it is outbreak in Nigeria since 2017. So let us see what symptoms it has been causing since then and is it different now. So rash, hallmark, fever, 88%, headache, 79%, lymphadenopathy, 68%. So we see besides rash, there are many other symptoms which are quite common, more than 50%. And if you look at the case definitions that has been given by WHO, just at the onset of this uh, epidemic pandemic, they try to uh, diagnose the case uh, with amalgamation of these symptoms. So case definition, a suspect probable. So we included these symptoms to, uh, to cast our wet 
uh, net wider and to pick up more and more patients. But how the things have turned out? You see, this is the WSO data of around 9,100 patients. Rash again is hallmark. But we see fever is less present in less than half, less than 50% of cases. So is lymphatic neuropathy, only 33% compared to somewhere around 68%. And genital rash is present in 38% cases, which was not very common prior. In fact, even it is not mentioned separately in the prior outbreak. So we do see that the clinical picture this time is different from what has been reported previously with the same clade of virus causing infection in Nigeria. So coming to the rash, the hallmark, it begins one to four days after appearance of fever and continues for two to four weeks. The characteristic features are it is well circumscribed, erythematous to vesicular pustular lesion, which often develop umbilication. And this progresses through sequential stages, macules, papules, vesicle, pustules, and scabs. This is what has been understood about monkeypox virus rash, what it used to cause. The distribution is centrifugal. Most common face, arms, and palms and sores. Face 98%, palms and sores 95%. Oral mucous membrane also, also common site 70%. Genitalia 28%. So, so these features are really helpful in differentiating it from other common conditions that we face. Currently, what we are seeing is more of varicella. So what has been described in monkeypox is a sequentially developing rash. First comes an anthem, then macules, then papules, vesicles, pustules, and crust. This all goes on a sequence. This is, this is what has been understood till now. The typical rash of monkeypox, so all these are depicted here. And these are the genital lesions, anal lesions, again monkeypox virus. This has been reported previously too, but in much lesser proportion of cases than is being currently reported. But it is different this time. Historically, the rash has been described as a synchronous evolve. Synchronous, it comes in one go and evolves from one stage to another. However, in the present epidemic, more than third, 33% of patients are presenting with a polymorphic rash. Now, this is going to cause a diagnostic dilemma clinically uh, when we are looking at varicella rash. Maculopapular rash have been observed in this epidemic that didn't become pustular or ulcerate. And in fact, the genital rash may precede the cutaneous rash and even precede the fever. So patient may just present with a genital rash, no fever, no pustular features. So these are the challenges in the, uh, identifying uh, these patients in the current epidemic. And genital and perianal areas are markedly affected, which is contrary to the previous epidemics. So what are the differentials that we need to keep in mind? Uh, so we basically need to divide it into two parts. One, uh, that these patients may just present with a genital rash, and these rashes are often painful. They become pruritic only at the very end. So the differentials will include herpes genitalis, chancroid, syphilis. When it presents with the systemic rash, uh, the most common differentials that we are seeing currently, most of the patients are being referred for testing are the patients of varicella and hand foot mouth disease. They may, uh, other things may be disseminated herpes simplex, disseminated herpes zoster, enteroviral rash, etc. So the most common differential that we are seeing currently, uh, varicella. How to differentiate varicella from monkeypox? So we know very well, varicella, the lesions come in crops. Monkeypox, hitherto has been known to be coming synchronous at one stage but this time it is different. So if it is synchronous, it will help, but if it is not, we cannot really say that it is uh, not monkeypox. Number of lesions in varicella is usually numerous. Monkeypox, the number of lesions in this epidemic are quite less, less than 10. In fact, they are averaging at around six lesions per patient. In varicella, the distribution of rash is more pronounced on the trunk. Whereas in monkeypox, it is mostly affecting the extremities and genitalia. Varicella almost never affects the palms and sores, but monkeypox, as such, usually used to affect palms and sores in the more than 75% of cases, but this time it is being reported in only 10 to 20% of cases. Also, very importantly, the varicella rash is very superficial. 
compared to the monkeypox rash, which is deeply embedded. So these are the few conditions that uh, may be confused with monkeypox. So can we identify this rash? So this is a primary syphilis rash, chancre, which begins as a papule, painless, non pruritic usually one to two centimeter ulcer with raised punctuated margins. A secondary syphilis rash is diffuse, symmetrical, macular or papular eruption involving the entire trunk and extremity, including palms and soles. Of late in the last one month, we have been seeing quite a number of cases of syphilis who are coming with rash. So just thought of including this here as a differential of monkeypox. Another condition which is very common right now, we are seeing many patients is hand, foot, and mouth disease. So this basically have an enanthem, exanthem. The enanthem is the atometrous macular vesicle, which forms a superficial ulcer with atometrous rim. And when there's an exanthem, it's macular, maculopapular, vesicular, causing confusion with the monkeypox. It usually resolves within three to four days. So these are the common three conditions that we are seeing currently, which may be confused with monkeypox, but there are other conditions too, as discussed. So how do we diagnose uh, ascending the sample? Uh, it is first subjected to an orthopox virus PCR. If positive, then it is subject to a monkeypox specific PCR. And uh, if positive, it is confirmed. Now come to the management part of it. The supportive care is the mainstay of treatment. There are some antivirals which are available uh, in the US. We will just briefly touch upon them as on, as also immunoglobulins are available. So vast majority of patients can be managed at home. Uh, the paper which came out from uh, in NEGM that showed only 13% of patients required hospital admission. So roughly 90% of patients can be managed at home. So what are the uh, instructions that are to be given? It is preferable to have, uh, keep the patient in a separate room with a separate bathroom not engage in sexual activity, do not share bed linens, clothing, etc. to prevent white bone transmission, routinely clean and disinfect commonly touch surfaces, particularly if other people are coming in that room. To ensure source control, uh, the patient should wear a medical mask and keep the lesions covered, particularly if he's in the same room with other persons. Also, uh, Avoid use of contact lenses because it can cause inadvertent infection of the eye and avoid scratching the rash covered areas. And also very important, avoid close contact with pets. So basically the supportive care includes the protection of the compromised skin and mucous membranes, uh, the management of skin rash with simple antiseptic creams, light dressing, do not touch or scratch lesions, Genital ulcers, which are the commonest symptoms, these are painful, sip spa, antiseptic cleaning, oral ulcers, you need some topical anti-inflammatory gels. Also, when this is uh, involving the oral mucous membrane, the intake of solids and liquids may be um, compromised, so rehydration therapy and nutritional support may be required, and obviously symptom mitigation in terms of fever, <coughs> pain, and pruritus, as this there needs to be managed. What are the features that because we are managing 90% of the patients at home, 90% uh, of the patients can be managed at home. What are the danger signs that need to be explained? The most common complications are secondary infections of this uh, skin lesion. So patients need to monitor whether the lesions are becoming more painful. They, uh, they need to be told how to identify signs of secondary infection in the rashes, redness, first discharge, etc. If the fever gets worse, it's unable to eat or drink. If involving the lungs, there may be difficulty in breathing, CNS system involvement, confusion, etc. And also importantly, it may involve the eye, and causing pain in the eye of the renal patient. So we need to tell the patient what are the signs to be monitored when they are isolating at home. So uh, hospital admission, when is it required? Uh, the current data, what we have, uh, tells us that only 13% of patients require hospital admission and most important, uh, the most common of this is due to pain management or the secondary bacterial infection of the lesions and also social purposes if uh, infection control at home is not possible, uh, patients may require hospital admission. Now this may be an important uh, parameter to look for in our country where overcrowding is common. 
there are complications related to tertiary organ involvement beyond skin even myocarditis is reported acute kidney injury is reported eye lesion is reported so when we are admitting a patient uh, just uh, very uh, briefly the infection prevention control what we need to do in the hospital setting the standard contact and droplet precautions and there is also a theoretical risk of airborne transmission so we need to take precautions uh, after uh, assessing the risk assessment and activities that could resuspend dry materials from lesions like use of portable fans or dry dusting sweeping this should be avoided what is the personal protective equipment that we need to wear gown gloves eye protection which may be a goggles or a face shield that covers the front and sides of the face and 95 marks and we need to use a dedicated foot footwear that can be decontaminated a disposable shoe cover sir not recommended uh, coming to the antivirus part of it none of this is available right now uh, widely But still, we need to understand the mechanism of action. So, so <clears throat> monkeypox virus is a DNA virus which uh, multiplies or replicates on the cytoplasm of host cell. So, we see various targets are when it is replicating. Drug uh, drug target drug can target the viral DNA polymerase. So, we have sidocovid, a less toxic form, brin sidocovid, not available of course. But this is the step that they uh, inhibit. And obviously, this will have also these drugs also have many uh, toxicities. The virus then replicates, and in the process of uh, budding out from the host cell, it can be stopped here by a novel drug called Decovirimab. It inhibits uh, protein P thirty seven, and uh, basically inhibits endosome derived transport vesicles and prevents the virus from escaping the cell. So it remains within the cell and uh, doesn't spread. Inside the body, so take over the mat. Uh, it prevents formation of less competent forms, that is the, the virus which can come out from the host cells by inhibiting P thirty seven. FDA approved it in twenty eighteen for smallpox treatment by the animal. So the animal rule is basically the drugs because these conditions which are not commonly happening, it's not ethical uh, to infect the people to test these drugs. So what they do. is they infect animal models they look for efficacy they look at the pharmacokinetics and in human beings the same drugs are administered and only the pharmacokinetic part of it is, is studied and if the pharmacokinetics are similar drug level concentration is actually similar and if at that drug concentration it is efficacious in animal model it is assumed that it will be efficacious in human beings and they are given approved so this is the animal rule so there is no clinical data of its use however um, uh, Currently, just a couple of days back, uh, data from New York showed that around 2,000 patients are there in New York, and um, <clears throat> around 600 of them are being treated with this uh, in this drug. So very soon we will have uh, more data on this drug. This is available both in uh, uh, oral and IV uh, formulation, and it is combined with the cyclodextrin component. So there will be some nephrotoxicity, but this doesn't really uh, exclude its use even in renal failure. Brin sidofovir is an analog of sidofovir. Sidofovir we have used sparingly, though uh, it is difficult to procure here. But we have used in uh, uh, CMV retinitis uh, in the past. But uh, it has many toxicities. So uh, the, the analog of uh, sidofovir is brin sidofovir. The side effects are much lesser. It, uh, as discussed, inhibits the DNA polymerase and uh, stops the replication. Again, this has been approved by the Animal rule. There are few studies which are available for this. Uh, unlike tecovirimab, there are two three animal studies which are available and has come up in the last one decade. Finally, uh, we have this immunoglobulin, uh, which is licensed by US FDA for treatment of complications due to replicating vaccinia vaccination. So uh, previously, the, this vaccine was being used in some people where it caused a complicated illness. Uh, because of the replicating uh, vaccine virus, it has been used. Obviously, there is no data regarding use in monkeypox, but it may be considered as a post-exposure prophylaxis theoretically. Now, coming to the vaccine part of it, so there are no direct monkeypox virus vaccines, but 
smallpox vaccine, uh, which has been used previously, has been shown to protect against monkeypox. So first generation smallpox vaccine like Trivax was used in 1970s, 80s. And um, data at that time did show that people who were vaccinated with the smallpox vaccine uh, were at least 85% effective in protecting, preventing monkeypox. This as a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So, so that is the rational for its use. But now we have much better uh, vaccines available. Second generation ACAM 2000, which is a replication competent virus. And, uh, uh, even better is a third generation Genios, which is a replication deficient uh, modified vaccine. Yeah, Vara strain based uh, vaccine. Um, this is what is shown here. This is likely to have the least side effects, though it requires two doses and. Uh, protection comes uh, two weeks after the second dose. The doses are given four weeks apart. So uh, by mathematical modeling studies, it is uh, also being uh, shown that it uh, will also be effective as a post-exposure profile access. In, in fact, CDC has given guidelines in that in people with high and intermediate risk of uh, contracting the disease, a vaccine given within four days from the date of the exposure prevents the onset of the disease. And uh, even if someone doesn't develop symptoms even beyond that period, it may be given up to 4 to 14 days to reduce the symptom severity. But obviously, we do not have any concrete outcome behind this. These are all derived from mathematical modeling studies. Currently, mass vaccination is definitely not warranted. How do we monitor contacts? The contacts need to be monitored for symptom onset for 21 days. That is the maximum median uh, incubation period that we know. They are not uh, encouraged to donate any blood tissue, etc. If they remain asymptomatic, they can continue routine activities. If they develop fever and rash in this period, uh, they should self isolate and contact the healthcare worker. And if they do not develop uh, fever but may have other symptoms like chills, lymphadenopathy, they should self isolate for 24 hours. If fever rash develops, they should report to health management. If it doesn't develop, they should be worked up for alternate etiology. Finally, is it like COVID? Definitely not. It requires a much high infective dose to be transmitted. There is no airborne transmission. Most likely, there is no pre symptomatic transmission as well. Even if it is, it is very, very minor, uh, which is contrasting with COVID. Uh, this, in fact, was the most important cause which drove the pandemic. And that disease is largely self limiting. Uh, with only around 10% requiring admission to pain management, which can in fact be managed at home also, and the mortality rate is well below 1%. So take home messages for, uh, for, from this brief overview. This is the largest outbreak reported in non-endemic countries till date. 89 countries have been affected as of today. More than 31,000 cases. The mortality rate is quite low at 0.04%. WHO declared it as a public health emergency of international concern on 23rd of July. But uh, it's interesting to note uh, the 15 people who, who were involved in decision making, only six were in favor of um, giving it a status of public health emergency of international concern. Nine were against it. But it is not a voting mechanism that they follow. Uh, probably they thought this would help in gearing up the healthcare infrastructure in various parts of the world to prevent further spread. So in that way, it is a prudent decision, but yes, it was not unanimous, even if it was not a majority driven decision. MSM population is predominantly affected due to close contact during sexual activity. We should definitely avoid stigma and discrimination because otherwise it will remain, particularly in our country, with the stigma and all, it can remain, people will, will not come forward. So we need to take care that we do not stigmatize it, we do not label this as an STD. A typical rash is common in this epidemic. We need to be aware of this so that we have a high index of suspicion, particularly patients coming with genital lesions, particularly in patients in the, the ART clinic. Uh, the lesions also may be in different stages presenting simultaneously, unlike what has been known previously. And even the prodromal symptoms that we have sent the patient may just come with the genital rash. Finally, this is a self-limited disease and supportive care is mainstay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Sanjay sir. Very nice and uh, up to date information. Uh, can you close share screen? So, 
So just uh, there are no questions from the audience. Just a couple of questions from my side. Anything you have seen in AIMS so far? Can you hear me? What is the major? The voice is not clear, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, any cases you have seen in AIMS? No, we really did see some suspected case, uh, patients, but they were referred to currently LNJP in Delhi is only admitting. We have four patients. Uh, fifth one actually came the day before. No, they were positive or they were suspected only? <laughs> they were uh, referred basically, uh, none of them, they were basically varicella. Okay. They, they were quite clinically varicella. And so as of now, all patients who are suspected are being referred to LNJP in Delhi. Okay. They are being managed in LNJP. So one other question is, what is the modality of death in the cause of death in these patients? So only 12 deaths till now. Uh, the data has not been revealed, but what is known from previous outbreaks is when the virus goes, uh, uh, secondary infections uh, is an important cause. And the when the virus involves lungs, pneumonia, involving the CNS systems, meningoencephalitis, these have been uh, reported. Organ as involvement, sir. Lung involvement, brain involvement, heart yes. involvement. Like that. Yes, yes. So, occasional mortality is there. So, yes. so, do you think it will come spread in India like it is spreading in Europe and America? Very unlikely, uh, particularly the mode of transmission that is there. Even in our ERT clinic, we checked uh, even after this. MSM is the, is the problem, is the issue, but it's not a very big issue like in some other parts of the world. So, my take is probably it won't be a big problem here. Okay. But we need to keep an vigil on it. Okay, so hopefully, let's hope that it doesn't spread that much and it's not like COVID. So, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. There are no questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pansal.